Emily Kaplan is an embodiment of versatility and expertise, having accrued over 17 years in investigative journalism, contributed to renowned platforms such as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, and ABC News 2020. Not just limited to journalism, Emily's diverse expertise spans from crisis management with affiliations like the Clio Group and major business deals to entre entrepreneurship in women's health and gyms. Educated at institutions like Smith College and Harvard Law School, her acumen extends to disrupting markets, navigating challenging terrains, and an unyielding commitment to projects like the Broken Science Initiative. In both journalism and business, Emily's multifaceted background places her in a league of her own. She is one of my very good friends. She is one of the most trusted people in the space. She is somebody I deeply admire and look up to, and I couldn't be more excited to welcome her to Revital Fest. Welcome, Em. It's so good to have you here. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. That was so sweet. I feel like we should just wrap it up here. That was great. <laughs> well, because you have way too much to offer for us to just leave it here. So, I mean, you wear so many different hats. How did your experience culminate in where you are today, specifically in helping other people navigate crisis? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that always comes to mind for me is that as a reporter, it was sort of like you wanted to give voice to the voiceless. And part of that was also helping people understand really complex information in ways that they could you know, then use in their own lives, right? And I think um, when you're thinking about crisis management, a lot of times it's also very similar, right? You're giving somebody who's in a vulnerable position a voice, and you're also really doing invest. I mean, a lot of what I do is investigative work to figure out how did the claim or the crime or the whatever get pinned on this person. So, you know, when I was at ABC, I covered murder. That was sort of my beat. And it's funny because I think about the crisis stuff. And a lot of that is like people who are in these really high stress situations trying to figure out how do you prove that you didn't do this thing or you didn't say it or you didn't mean it, right? Or a product entering a marketplace that's really saturated. How do you differentiate yourself? And I think as far as, you know, the stuff that Greg and I are doing with Broken Science, it's a lot of that same stuff, right? Like so much of health and medicine and science feels so complex to people that I think they have an allergy to it. They don't even, they don't want to touch it. You just want to defer to authority and sort of hope and pray for the best. And unfortunately, I mean, in medicine in particular, it's so broken. And I mean, all of the sort of benchmarks of where we look for advice are really not working the way that they were intended to. So the onus has to be on the individual to come up with a strategy and a plan so that when they find themselves in a medical situation where they're vulnerable, they're able to chart their own course and they can sess up what's good information, what's bad information, what are my sources that I can rely on, and also like how do I feel about myself? I think one of the things that's really mess missing from a lot of this is the patient's ability to ask questions, right? Like you're it, you're you're feeling really nervous. The doctor's telling you you need to, you know, this is the protocol I recommend, this is standard of care. And you sort of are just like, okay, like, I'll do whatever you say. I don't know. This isn't my turf. And in fact, there's so many great questions that are super simple that people can ask that will make completely reroute that to something else. And maybe it won't, but at least you're going in feeling informed. I think there's nothing more terrifying than feeling like you're not in control and you don't understand what's happening. So I, we designed this course for broken science that's really on like navigating your health and your healthcare and whatever. And it's like, you know, I started by thinking after talking to you, like we should do like a pamphlet. And now it's like it's yeah. over 90 pages. And we're we've been like working really hard on redesigning the website. So we have I've been learning AI stuff from our tech gurus and it's amazing. So where the course will be, which actually the whole website's going to be, you get to go in and you're going to sort of go through these lessons that you can take, you know, decide what you take. You may be really interested in insurance. Like there's a lot of stuff about insurance that people get really overwhelmed with, or like, you know, people don't know you can take money out of your 401k to help offset bills. There's certain bills that they can't put on your credit score. So you don't, if you don't want to pay them, you don't have to. Like, what happens if you die? Do the bills get left to your heirs? So like all that kind of technical stuff. But maybe you're going in for like a mammogram and like you don't need to know about all the issues that have to do. So you can skip that. So it's a really sort of like choose your own adventure course. But what's cool is that because of the way we've developed these sort of like neural networks and AI systems in the back end, we're going to be able to give you a printout of your things 
right? So like, these are the questions you want to ask. You were really confused about relative risk versus absolute risk, or what's the difference between sensitivity and specificity when you're looking at test results or what the test is. So here's a little reminder. When you go to the doctor and they mention these words, like here are the ones that you should really be paying attention to. And then things like how to have an advocate, right? And like how to have somebody who can help you with areas that are too stressful for you. So we can get into like more details about all of this, but I think as a sort of overview, my feeling is like people often say like, I can't believe you ran that business and you were an investigative reporter. And I'm like, why? It was like the same job. You know what I mean? Like you're going in, you're assessing a marketplace or a story, you're taking it apart, you're figuring out what you can grow, what you can't, what the core is, who's going to receive it well, who's not, what other information is out there, opportunities. And I think crisis management, along with sort of health and science reporting, and certainly all the work we're doing at BSI are very similar. We're in a major crisis, like full stop. Science is in a crisis. And that means any individual who's interacting with anything scientific is also part of that crisis. So if we can just start by giving people like returning that autonomy by giving them education, they'll be able to make these great decisions. So I feel like one of the things that broken science is that we've come up with this idea that really it's like, who is this for? And it's like, yeah, Greg has that great thing about how it's like, you know, it's not for everyone, it's for anyone, which he had for CrossFit. And that's very applicable here. But I also think there's something to be said for just like different groups that I want to focus on. And one of them is parents who have recognized the school system's broken, right? So their kids aren't getting what they need. And so maybe you're not able to homeschool your kids, but you want to augment it with something. So that's a sort of a channel or what I'm calling a society. People who are in fitness and health who, you know, not the dude who just opened the box, right? But, or the gym, but somebody who's been in this for a while and recognizes like there's so much interesting science coming out about exercise physiology and nutrition, we should be offering that to people so that they can better educate themselves. I feel like there's nothing worse at a job than when you feel like you're stale and you're saying the same things over. So like inspiring people to do that. Um, and then like obviously doctors, right? So like all your work at CrossFit Health, it's sort of a continuation of some of that by saying to these doctors like, hey, we want to be a really good resource for you so that when you, you can understand like why p-values are meaningless. What study is good? What study isn't good? How do you know that? And so we're going to make those available at three different levels, sort of like beginner, intermediate, and advanced for the website. So you'll be able to come in and navigate at any level and, and really sort of chart your own course, but also leave with some really tangible ways of thinking that I think in the last you know three years since we've been working on this project, like I look at the world differently. Like probability theory changes everything about how you think. And I think it's really innate to the way our brains are designed, where like you're constantly taking prior information and putting it into an equation, right? Like not to get scary, but like, and, and evaluating what decision to make. Yeah. The idea that everything is yes, no, is so off, right? So like, it's like the idea of like, do you trust your best friend? Well, of course. Do you trust her 100%? No. <laughs> do you trust her zero? No, she wouldn't be your best friend. It's somewhere in the middle and it can change, right? So like she may do something that's not so great and then you're not going to trust her so much, right? Or she may really prove herself and you're going to trust her more. That's all probability theory. So like people get really confused about this stuff and it's not. And I think it's almost like taxes where we've like overcomplicated a lot of this stuff. And then people are like, I need an accountant. And it's like, no, you don't. You don't. You just need to believe in yourself enough that you can make these decisions for yourself and your family, right? And you're going to have better outcomes because you're knowingly going into the situation, knowing that you don't know everything, but that you have some blocks that you can work off of and develop and make your own choices for yourself. Oh my God, you literally just blown my mind. This is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. I mean, I know that you are up to these phenomenal things, but hearing you just describe it, like in, you know, while watching you is incredible. Damn, you guys are going to change so many people's lives. I hope so. I mean, and I think, you know, the truth is, if we don't, if we only change a few people, I feel like that's still a huge success because. People are, I think people are desperate for this information, but nobody really knows how to get it. And nobody knows like, what does it look like? Right. I mean, I think I'm not somebody who reads self-help books. Like they just don't appeal to me at all. But like, I have other people who I'm, are very close in my life that read tons of them. 
And I'm always like, just go outside, like just go get the job, right? Like don't read 30 books about how to get your dream job. Just like go work somewhere. That's sort of interesting. And, you know, so like with this, I sort of feel like, no, 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 just do it. Just try. And I hope that this class that you inspired is a way, it's a real entry point for people. Because the other thing is that we have so many people who are caretakers, right? And I think there's so, I mean, we can get into statistics about like how little time doctors have. I think I have some numbers actually, like how little time doctors spend with patients. And most of the time that they have with patients, they're on their computers. So it, I, I'm not blaming doctors. I think the system is so broken that they're not, I mean, they didn't get into medicine to do billing codes. That's an accountant's job, right? Yeah. They're not list, They're not looking and they're not listening to patients, not because they're bad people or because they don't care about their patients, but because the system is demanding something else of them right now. So it's like, I remember this um, study that I was really, really blown away by that was talking about how when patients go to the doctor, they usually list their least significant symptoms first, right? And we'll, well, that's natural, right? You don't want to say like, I'm having heart palpitations. You say like, well, sometimes I like sweat at night or, you know, like I find I'm out of breath when I'm walking. And then they the, the symptoms tend to escalate. But the doctors only hear the first two or three things you say. So there's such a disconnect just in that level of communication that the doctors aren't hearing the most significant thing and the patients aren't taught to communicate, hey, they're they're going to be really distracted five minutes into this conversation. So you've got to lead with what is most important to you. And I think oftentimes, and I've seen this even with my own parents, you can be like the strongest person in the world. But when you're confronted with like mortality or some big health issue, it really makes you just want to be cared for. And so the idea of challenging anybody or even asking questions becomes really like a insurmountable challenge. So I always like to say, like, bring somebody with you, right? Like have somebody who's going to go and take notes for you, but also ask the questions that maybe you think you're kind of nervous to ask because you want to get along with the doctor. You want the doctor to like you. You don't want to seem confrontational or challenging of their authority that they're going to be in charge of your care, right? Right. But you can have the bad cop come and say, like, well, I'm sorry. Like, what is that trial based on? Was it middle aged you know, women who were in their 40s? Can you point me to three studies that back up these claims? Like, what would your critics say? What would the critics of this protocol say? What would happen if I decided not to do it? What's that trajectory? Right? What is all cause mortality is my favorite question. We should all be asking our doctors with every drug they put you on. And with every treatment that they suggest, what is all-cause mortality associated with this intervention? Because so often people and doctors become very specialized. They become focused on this treatment works because it cures this thing. But all-cause mortality means like, do the people who have this treatment live longer or shorter than the people who don't have it or all people, right? And that's telling you something totally different because we know that a lot of the treatments are toxic. And so that's, that's fine. It's a risk reward, right? It might be worth the risk to take that treatment because the risk of death or harm is great if you don't, or you're older in age, right? Like my dad can do all kinds of medical things that I would never do because he's not going to live for another 20, 30 years. Hopefully I will. Mm -hmm. These are very different calculations that people need to be making all the time, but no one is training anybody on how to communicate in the medical sphere as a patient. And so I'm hoping that that's sort of what we can get into a little bit because it's it's at, it's a requirement because of how broken the system is. And it's something that's not that hard. But can I ask your opinion? How many doctors do you think would be able to honestly answer those questions? Because I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking, I don't know many doctors who do know the research. I don't know. And with all love and respect to doctors, please don't get me wrong, you know, but they're here to treat symptoms and they have a rep who comes in and talks to them about this latest drug and what it supposedly does. Like how many of them have time in this broken system that we're in to really go and research and look into it? Well, so I think this is part of what my, um, you know, sort of like back a door hope is is that when if we can get an army of patients who are going in and asking their doctors these questions, then the doctors are going to start realizing, I really need to get up on the research. 
I need to be able to provide. These are not ridiculous questions. Like the doctors know these are really reasonable questions for anybody to ask. And if I don't have an answer to it, then I'm not doing my job, right? And so, I mean, again, I think that's that it's easier for somebody other than the patient to ask those questions. But I've been in situations where I ask these questions and the doctors are usually like pretty open to it. And they'll say, you know what? There's like two hallmark studies on this thing. And they'll kind of be able to give you enough that you can Google it and you can message them through like, you know, the gateway portals that these doctors have. And I mean, I go back and forth with doctors a lot. I mean, one of my other favorite things, which I didn't realize, except that like I, you know, I feel like my nickname used to be the Riddler because I asked too many questions. But um, I think one of my kids was at the had an ear infection. Yeah, their ear was hurting. And we went to the doctor and the doctor was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's a mild ear infection. Let me write you a script for these antibiotics. And I said, well, do you think that he needs the antibiotics? And the doctor sort of looked at me and was like, you know, and I mean, I guess that could be seen as a challenging question because he's writing the script. But I was like, he's had a bunch of ear infections. I'd prefer to not put him on the antibiotics if he doesn't yeah. need it. Um, and he was like, well, you know, it's sort of like a thing where most parents don't want to be up all night with their kids, if their kids are crying or in pain. Yeah. And so like, no, he doesn't need them. This will probably resolve itself. But for the sanity of the family, like my go-to is to write the script. And so, you know, it's like just in that little interaction, I got new information about how important it was, how necessary the antibiotics were. And we had a nice dialogue, right? It wasn't, and I was sort of like, you know what? Like, I totally get that, but like, I can stay up tonight and I'd yeah. rather do that. Yeah. So like, whereas somebody else might say like, I can't, you know what I mean? I've got a bunch of other kids. I have to get up early in the morning for work, whatever. That's not my choice. But that's why I sort of feel like these things, you have to be able to, you know, both in being a parent and being protective of your children, advocate for yourself and other people in a way where like, this isn't combative. I'm just trying to understand what the options are. Right. And so the other one that's like that, that's always mind blowing because, you know, doctors are far less likely to do treatments. Like they know so much about medicine that they like, I feel like most of the doctors that I'm friends with, they don't go to the doctor, right? They don't have regular oh, screenings, no, right? right? Like that says something like, why are you not doing this stuff, but you're telling everybody else to. And I, so one of my other favorite questions, because they are required to do standard of care. And so standard of care is just the American Medical Association comes up with guidelines for how things are treated. And that makes sense, right? Just sort of standard protocol. This is what we recommend. Yeah. But if you say to a doctor, if it was you or if it was your kid, yeah. what would you do? Yeah. That eliminates the responsibility for them to say what standard of care is. It literally alleviates the liability and all kinds of other things. And then they can look at you and they can say, you know what? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't have the surgery. I'd wait a year. I'd you know, try this other medicine first or change your diet. I'd try these three things before I do that, but they, they're not allowed to tell you that unless you ask them as a personal anecdotal, what would you do? And they like that. I mean, you're, it's not, that's not combative at all. You're just saying like, okay, I totally get this. This is the protocol. I'm supposed to be taking these things or doing this stuff or having the surgery. But if it was you, what would you do? And then they're sort of caught off guard, but it's like, oh, right. I'm a human. You're a human. What would you do? You're an expert on this. What, would, what if it was your kid? You will get wildly different answers that are really informative. And it doesn't mean you're going to do what they did or they're recommending that they would do, but it opens the discussion. And I think it really sets the stage for a better relationship with the doctor because they, now they know you're engaged, right? And they know that like also, I mean, I think I'm sure my doctors, some of whom are friends of mine, will say like, if Emily's coming in, like book double the amount of time, right? and <laughs> Also, like, be prepared for, like, five studies to be sent before she arrives that, like, you better read, right? And, I mean, I'm lucky. I feel like I've done a really good job trying to find doctors that are open to that. And I think younger doctors are actually much more open. I mean, that's a huge stereotype. But I think there is something about the younger crop of med students and doctors coming up that is more um, open to discourse, there's less of the hierarchical stuff that there has always been in medicine where they're like, you know, they're put through the ringer as residents. And once you've earned the right to, you know, ha write a script and do like there are different levels of this hierarchy and like it's pretty hardcore. But I think that there the, there's some chips in that 
that you can find people who are really, you know, they're doing it because they love it. And medicine is, you know, it's a science and an art. And so you need to have find people, find people who really are passionate about whatever it is that they're treating and want to learn. So I'm so excited for this. This is absolutely fascinating. I honestly haven't wanted to take a course for a very long time because I just, you know, I feel so overwhelmed with everything that that's ha like happens in day to day life. But this is the first time where I'm like, can you just tell me when it's available so I can actually enroll and do this? Can you take us through the curriculum that you have outlined? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's, again, since it's sort of like a chart your own course, okay. there's a whole, like the first section is basically like, are you the patient? Or are you the caregiver? And by caregiver, I mean like advocate, not a medical caregiver. And again, it's like it's not a medical course, right? Like I'm not a doctor. It's really like a communications course. Um, and then I have to kind of remember because I, it's been a little while since I went through it. But we have a whole – you can skip through. There's a whole thing I have about like sort of identifying what your fears are. Okay. Because the other thing that happens, like your brain shuts down when you're in a crisis, right? So like you have symptoms. It could be at any stage of things really. But like you have symptoms of something and you immediately like go on Google – and it says that you've got this like terminal illness and you're like, you know, Amazing. and so then there's sort of like matching up where you are in the progress of things. Like, have you been diagnosed with something? Are you, you know, exploring the possibility of something being wrong? And then it leads you into different things. So, I mean, I think overall there's like 15 videos of where I'm sort of explaining what different things are, right? So going through what's the difference between an observational study and a randomized controlled trial right? Like these are really important. We make so many things up about observational studies, which cannot say anything about cause, right? So anytime you see linked, I mean, you know, all this stuff, right? Um, and you see this in headlines all the time, right? It's like eating jello makes your boobs bigger. And it's like, wait, what? Like, that's not true. And you get in and it's like, oh, there's an, there's an association between people who eat green jello and big boobs, right? Or like there's an, I mean, like rain and umbrellas is a good one. I love that because I feel like it really goes to this idea of like, sure, when it's raining out, there's higher uses usage of umbrellas. Okay. But are the umbrellas causing the rain? No. Right. And we do. And I think because, I mean, as a news person, people are constantly looking for this significant finding. And so it's greatly exaggerated. So there's a lot of breakdown of that. But then there's also stuff like I get into what's hazard ratio versus all cause mortality how do you, you know, sort of like what's a p value, which I know nobody, everybody, nobody wants to talk about, but it's really like, I mean, it's not that complicated and it's important. Like how, um, I don't know, I mean, like there's a lot of those videos, and so you can decide what to watch and what not to watch. And then there are little quizzes you can take or not take. But if you take them, what it does is it will let us know, it lets the algorithm know essentially like where your weaknesses are. And so it can reiterate some of that or give you more literature in a different way. So like if you prefer to watch videos, great. We'll give you more videos. We're going to start to know that about you as you get through the course. If you prefer to read or have audio, like those will all be different options. Um, but it also is, you know, there's a whole thing, again, on like finances, because I think that's a big thing people worry about. And, you know, again, like how often do you go to the doctor and the doctor says like, oh, well, this is going to be a $20,000 procedure, right? And like insurance will cover this much and then it's on you. Like the doctors don't talk about any of that stuff. Yeah. And like pre-approval and all of that stuff is like, it's yeah. not, it shouldn't be so complicated, but it actually, it's very complicated and it's a huge source of stress. So I try to go through that in a way that people at least feel like they have a handle on what the different words are. And, you know, what the different things mean and questions to ask, right? So you can always ask your doctor, like, hey, they know what your insurance is. Like, what's my copay going to be? Yeah. What happens if something goes wrong in the surgery, right? Um, and I mean, I, like, really what I'm trying to do with the course is give people the tools so that they can, you know, sort of get through the process, but also learn from it and feel better for it. And I think there's so much about quality of life that's missing from everything that we do in medicine. So there's also a whole thing on like, you know, I think it's really important because of the way the brain shuts down. So, you know, like your prefrontal cortex is where you make all your decisions and your amygdala is like emotion and fear and all of that. And the amygdala like really takes over in a crisis. So you're not able to make rational decisions. I mean, you may think you are, but you're not. And so being able to chart ahead, like if this happens, I'll do this. Or I don't want to do the medical research because it's going to freak me out. I went on Google and it was already too much. And I'm like planning my funeral and I need somebody else to do that. 
So then you assign tasks to people. So like one of the things that will print out for you is like, I need an advocate to help with these things, right? Like I can go to the doctor by myself, but I need somebody who I can call right afterwards and tell them what happened and they can keep a log of it because we don't remember things, right? And so like symptoms need to be tracked and also doctor's appointments need to be tracked. Tests need to be tracked, right? And I also always think things about like preventative medicine is a huge opportunity in these moments, right? Because you're facing this crisis and it's oftentimes a great sort of impetus or inspiration to change things in your life. And again, like doctors don't talk about this, right? Like you do get an A1C test every time you have your physical. And if you're pre-diabetic, the doctor should say, hey, whoa, we are on the cusp here. This is serious. Here are some things that you can do so that we don't jump over the bridge. That doesn't happen. So I think asking those questions and then doing your own research about like, hey, now that I've been diagnosed with this thing, I'm probably more likely to have these other things, right? Or if I lost 30 pounds, it would mean that I wouldn't be, like I would take one of the risk factors off the table for this reoccurring or for, you know, other chronic illnesses being added. I mean, we know that when people get one chronic illness, it's like within five years, they get another one. So the, the compound interest of these things, like head it off. Like, don't let this be an isolated incident. It's a warning to your body and your mind that things aren't regulated right. So what else can you do to make those changes? And so one of the other things in the course is um, when I was at ABC, there was a minor disaster. So like the, you know, mine, the mine shaft collapsed and these guys are all stuck underground. And I remember when we were covering it, one of the things that was wild was they had this I don't know, it must have been like a behavioral psychologist or something. And they came up with this crazy routine for the guys. And I was like, they're stuck underground. They can't do anything except think about dying, right? Why are they being told to get up at like six in the morning and do push-ups? Wow. And then they're being told to talk to each other and they're giving topics, right? About what they need to discuss. It's like, this is crazy. And it was explained to me that no, actually the mind goes insane, literally, and panics and they will fight and kill each other if there isn't a routine. So the routine is serving this fundamental purpose of keeping order because the brain likes order and it like, I mean, again, probability theory, it likes to predict what's going to come next. Yeah. And if the overarching thing that's coming next is death, not good. So if instead you're really scheduled and it's like, okay, we got to do 50 push-ups in 10 minutes, right? Like, and then we've got five minutes off and then we've got to discuss like the great Gatsby or that's not what they were discussing, but like, you know, whatever, <laughs> like then you're, you're thinking about the next thing and you know what it is. You can relax. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's absolutely the same. And so when people are going through some sort of health situation, I don't like picking things that are outside of your normal. Like, I don't like it when people are like, I'm going to start working out really hard five days a week because A, you won't stick to it. And B, it may not be like physically possible for you to take on a big task like that if you're not already conditioned to do it. Right. So I like things like, you know, call your friend. Like, what could you do from a hospital bed? Right. Mm -hmm. So you make a list of people that you haven't talked to for a long time, like start calling them, say like, hey, I'd love to talk to you every Sunday. So you have a calendar of people that you're going to talk to every day of the week. And you can do it from anywhere, right? And it doesn't really require much, much like physical exertion, but there's a regularity and there's the ability for the brain to relax, knowing that this thing is happening next. And it's something to look forward to, which we know with depression is a big thing, right? If you have little things that you can look forward to in your life, you're far less likely to fall into a depression. And I think that's the other thing that happens to people when they're in these sort of you know, tricky health situations is things just become so overwhelming that they want to just fall into isolation. So there's a lot in the course. And I mean, it's everything from like this heavy medical understanding to also this sort of, I mean, I know never, nobody likes social emotional because it's been overused so much, but it is sort of looking at like, what is the psychology of all of this? What's happening to you and what can you do and what can your plan be so that you don't fall into these very common pitfalls? Um, This is absolutely insanely amazing. I honestly, I'm sitting here just thinking, this woman is a genius. She's phenomenal. Like you were essentially, I don't like the word empowerment, but I'm going to use it. You are empowering patients and caregivers to understand what is within their control in order to create a plan of action that's going to benefit them, right? Instead of being lost in the system that is so easy to get lost in. I mean, I don't even want to go see a doctor because of all of this stuff. 
that yeah. you're talking about, right? Yeah. So um, I think it's absolutely incredible. Um, talk to me about in ending the Broken Science Initiative, where we can find you, what's happening, just an overarching. So science.org is like, that's where you go. Um, right now, the website is really designed as sort of like a repository of articles that Greg and I were reading and that we wanted to be able to share with people. So it wasn't designed to be like really user interactive, but the new site will be up in two weeks. So I think by the time this runs, yes! it'll be up. Um, and it's totally different. Like it'll be, there's a wizard that's going to take you through and figure out what you're interested in and what you want to learn, but you're scared about and what levels you are. Um, there's a whole, I mean, like Mia and Ethan who do all our tech are just absolute geniuses. And so I love them because I can be like, Hey guys, what if we did this? And they're like, well, I think yeah, we can probably build something like that. So like we had a call last week and somebody on the team was like, with all the, with the course, this class, they were like, are you guys, what is the model you're using? Like, where did you find that? And we're like, we're making it. We are making it from scratch. It's not a available thing that's a template, right? And so it and it the system is so crazy that it's gonna like keep learning as we do stuff, right? So it's gonna learn like how do people interact with this? What are they reading? What are they not? We're gonna do this thing, which is silly, but I think it's kind of funny. We're like, like I prefer to listen to stuff than I do to read stuff. And oftentimes I'll read and like I write notes in the margins, right? So like Bob and Greg have been trying to get me on Kindle forever because I travel with like five books and they're like, your suitcase is like 50 pounds. Like what is wrong with you? And 50 pounds of books. And so, but I can't because I have these weird systems where I like put squares around like character names and I like star different things that are thematic or like whatever, you know what I mean? Like I have my own whatever um, crazy system. And so, but I do like to listen to stuff and then go back and read it because it's like that double yeah. imprint really helps me. And um, and so I was like, a lot of this stuff is really heady, but if people could read it, like if we can do it at these different levels, you could go in and listen to it and then go back and be like, okay, I want to read it at the higher level. Like I get the basic points of this. And so we're having this AI that's been trained to be like me and then one trained to be like Greg. So you can have Greg read it to you or you can have Emily read it to you. <laughs> oh my God. And this is insane. But it's sort of funny that the voice we have for Greg is like not working, right? And so it has this like funny Southern twang. So it's like, it's clearly Greg Glassman, but like with a little <laughs> bit of his like Arkansas background like coming through. <laughs> Oh my God, this is so fun. Oh. So it's, I mean, it's very cool. And I think, you know, that class is one, but I'm the next one we're doing is a nutrition class. And it's going to basically take all of Zoe Harkum and Gary Taubes and like all of our big people who we love yeah. and we think have gotten it right. And it's going to take their work and it's going to be compiled into a nutrition class that you can take for yourself. And then there's going to be like a higher level that you can teach other people. Um. <laughs> So yeah, oh. I, and I mean, like, it's sort of endless. Like, I want to have your sugar course on our site if you wanted to do that. I know we've talked about Oh my about God, it. I would love nothing more. Please. I mean, because for me, it's like really about hosting this. And I've even gone back and forth on the idea of like making this healthcare class, like making all the materials free. And then it's, you, you just pay if you want to go through and get the customized result. Because I don't like the idea of us hoarding information from people. Um, yeah. And so like, we have four books coming out for Broken Science and one of the issues that we've come up with is that one of them is David Stove's book, which I bought the rights to. Um, and the publisher who I'm working with, they have a deal with Amazon. This is sort of like tangential, but they basically have to charge. They give Amazon the price that's the lowest price in the marketplace. And Greg and I are like, well, we want it to be free. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you just bought this book and you want to make it free. And I'm like, I want to make it free. And then if people want to buy the beautiful hard copy, we have a designer doing a, in, like imprint design for us. Then you buy the hard copy. Sure. But like this, my information needs to be available to people, especially information that so greatly we think enhances your life and allows you to think critically. Like, who am I to keep that for myself? Right. I so, you know, I mean, and I think that's part of this. It's like all these medical journals that are behind these crazy paywalls, right? And like, so the average person cannot access them. So then you, you're you really left, if you don't know how to like, you know, use the back channels that I use to get these articles, like you, you're you really left beholden to the doctor, right? So the doctor says, hey, Karin, like check out this study. You'll like this study. It's, you know, women your age who have experienced this, you know, the same symptoms and they use this drug and they all came out great, right? Yeah. You go and you want to check it out. You can't like yeah. that's like, and we as American taxpayers have paid for that research. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then it's in a library at a university that we're paying for 
and we can't access it unless we pay $30 for the story. Like that feels like robbery. It really bothers me. Yeah. Yeah. I so, agree. well, um, I love what you're doing. I am in support of you and I'm not only in support. I am an athlete. All of you, you are, you say I, that to everybody, don't you? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I say, I say nice things to everyone because I do like genuinely when I interview somebody, I genuinely fall in love with them during the interview. Like I, you are one of the smartest, most oh. beautiful, sparky and sparkly, sparkness humans in the world. Like I admire and adore you beyond belief. You are going to change the world and I can't wait to support you in doing that. Oh, that means so much to me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it.